and it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce this year's MED conference. The MED conf this is the 11th edition of the MED conference. The MED conference was started by a group of healthcare providers, nurses, physiotherapists, physicians, who uh, were interested in exploring the humanity in medicine to understand the meaning of what, what we are doing, what we are all doing in taking care of people. And we've had several conferences over the last few years um, in the United States and in Canada. And unfortunately, last year we did not have one and we're back, we're happy to be back this year, although virtually. And we hope that next year we'll be in, in presence as they say now. So um, this year obviously has been a very difficult year and a very challenging year. Um, it's seen um, a, an upheaval of how we do what we do, um, how we do, how we work in, uh, in the healthcare uh, places, in hospitals and clinics, at home. And uh, it's been difficult at times. However, it has also uh, led to new opportunities. And we thought this year that we'd focus on, on uh, what we've gained, what we've learned this year, uh, in, in the past year and a half, in fact which is why we've entitled this, this year's conference Immunity and Beyond. We've all gained immunity, whether it be through a vaccine or through the, through the disease. But we'd like to, and we will talk about that as well, but we'd like to look beyond as well. What, what, what has, what has uh, changed us or what have we seen that is actually useful for us, for our path towards our destiny, towards happiness in our lives? And so we have, a, we have quite an eclectic mix of speakers today, uh, several sharing their own experiences. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the vaccine as well, uh, the miracles that have happened in the last year and a half. Indeed, this morning I was listening to a, a, on NPR to Nubar Afeyan, the founder of Moderna, who told us that um, the, the RNA sequence for the vaccine was developed in exactly two days after the sequence of, of COVID was, 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 was um, was shared by the Chinese. So there have been, we've been amazed by the science, no doubt. And, but we've also been amazed by, by what we've discovered about ourselves, what we've discovered about others. What we discovered also, whether it be the needs, the difficulties, the challenges, and also the beauties in taking care of others, in taking care of others who are sick. So uh, today we'll be, we'll be exploring that from many different angles. And uh, I hope you'll, you'll enjoy it. And I'd like to uh, simply tell you that if you have questions during any of the talks, please write them in the chat. And uh, the moderator of each talk will collect them at the end and then select those that, that can be asked in the time that is allotted. And uh, at, the end of, at the end of the day, also there'll be an opportunity to send your comments, your feedback to the email that will be provided. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first session this morning. And uh, to do that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alice Grassi, who's an anesthesiologist and an uh, intensive care specialist, who's now a clinical fellow at the Toronto General Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce this first uh, session of the, uh, this edition, online edition of the MED conference. With this session, we, we go right to the heart of the matter because we will listen to two experiences from the battlefield. Uh, the interesting thing is this, uh, uh, these two experiences come from the same hospital because these are two people who have been working together in a busy COVID unit. And they're gonna share with us what they, what, what they lived and what they learned. Uh, during this uh, unique experience in their career. So I'm gonna uh, briefly introduce them. Um, Federica Fromm is a, a physician who received a bachelor, uh, at first a bachelor of arts degrees in history and classic at New York University, and then uh, received her DO degree at the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, she did a residency in internal medicine at Sunny Down State in Brooklyn, and then practiced as an internal medicine hospitalist for two years at Phelps Memorial Hospital in Sleepy Hollow, New York. She's currently a full-time hospitalist at St. Cloud, Cloud Hospital in Minnesota, where she has been practicing for seven years. 
and serves on the Executive Leadership Council for her hospitalist group. She helped to found and also the American Association of Medicine and the Person, and she has been on the board of this association. And she also has been on the planning committee of the annual med conference since when it started in 2009. She's married and has three children. Alongside her, uh, Lisa Kilgard will share our exper her experience with us. And uh, she's uh, uh, a nurse, a uh, BSN Prepare Registered Nurse, who also works at St. Cloud Hospital. Uh, she has a certification in medicine and surgical nursing uh, and uh, as a public health nurse and school nurse. Um, she became a nurse, and maybe she will share this with us, I don't know, uh, because of her life experience of being herself a patient when she was a child. And since then, she has been desired to be a nurse. Um, she also loves spending time with her family and to enjoy little things in life. And she says that after 20, uh, 19 years of experience um, as a uh, like in different uh, like nursing experience, nothing would have prepared her to what she faced last year. Um, and she would share with us what, uh, what she learned and how difficult yet rewarding this year was. So uh, without further hesitation, I'm gonna uh, let uh, Federica start. Hi, thank you, Alice. Um, it's a real gift for me uh, to be here and talk to you guys about my experience working the COVID unit. Um, I've spoken at the med conference a few times before. I've been here as a medical student trying to affirm what I, why I wanted to be a doctor. I have shared here as an expectant mother while trying to survive intern year. But most of all, um, I've been the recipient of so much knowledge and I've learned so much from all the speakers over the years at the med conference and so I am grateful for it and I still carry with me a lot of the things that I've learned here and so I hope that today what Lisa and I can share can maybe shed some light for other people. Um, so COVID has been probably one of the most beautiful struggles that I've had to face in my life and definitely in my career. It has felt like a curse many times and I have to admit that there are days that it still does but it has also turned out to be what I can now say a gift. Um, I've never been asked so many times as in this last year if COVID has made me lose my love for medicine. And if there is one thing that I can say for sure today is that if nothing else, actually COVID has strengthened my certainty that being a physician is not just um, a job for me. It's my vocation, it's my life, and it's truly who I am. Um, so, I, um, I was one of the ones who initially did not think that COVID uh, was going to be a thing. I really rem I remember a friend of mine calling me after reading a New York Times article about what was going on in Asia back in February um, of 2020 and telling me that her legs were shaking and she could tell that this was going to be big. And I remember just downplaying it and saying this will blow over. And I actually, myself with my family got on a plane to go to Mexico because I just thought by the time I'd be back, everything would be better. But I was wrong. I was very, very wrong. Um, by the end of March of that year, our hospital was ready. We had set up the beginning of what we didn't even know was going to be a COVID unit. Um, and we were ready. We were ready for the worst to come. I remember I'm just a internal medicine hospitalist. I don't do any ICU and I remember being trained over two days about vent management in case um, I had to be a resource in the ICU, which, and it was really terrifying. Um, so the first few cases start coming in. And so we initiate COVID rounding. And my friend and I are the first two chosen out of our group of 40 physicians to round in the COVID unit. No one in our group had done it. We had read many articles about it. We had tried to you know, know what was going on, but no one knew what to expect. Um, and I remember that morning uh, walking up and standing outside of the COVID unit and my colleague and I are standing there uh, trying to figure out how to put our PPE on. And it just all seemed very surreal. I remember him looking at me, um, you know, with his N95 and a face shield and saying, this feels like we're kind of walking into combat. We have no idea what, what awaits us, but remember we're here to serve and we owe it to them to do our best, even though we don't know what we're doing. 
So Juan is my first COVID patient I will ever meet. He's um, 45 years old, he's an illegal Mexican immigrant. He doesn't speak English, he has no insurance and he can't breathe. That's the first thing I noticed. I um, will never forget the first time I heard the sound of a COVID patient gasping for air. It's not the same as others. I have been a physician for 12 years. I have watched many people die. I've put a lot of patients on comfort care and accompanied them to the end, but this is different. He's 45, he's scared. And no matter how much oxygen we're trying to deliver to him via nasal cannula, he cannot get comfortable. He tells me that he was exposed at work. Um, the Genio meat factory had not closed. They were not following any of the quarantine protocols because they knew that they had all these illegal employees and so they didn't have to meet any of the criteria. Um, and so he knew, he knew there was COVID at work, but he told me that um, he would have rather died of COVID than to have his kids starve. If he didn't go to work, he didn't get paid. And so he kept working and now he's sick and he can't breathe. From that very moment, I realized COVID was not just a disease. It carried with it so much social, economic and political weight to it. But Juan couldn't breathe and I was standing there at me. I couldn't breathe either for different reasons. I felt powerless. He was terrified he was going to die and he was alone. And he kept saying he was scared and he didn't wanna be alone. Um, before starting the COVID unit, I remember one of the things that they had drilled into our brains as we stood outside those doors was um, to walk in and out, spend the least amount of time in the room as possible, to stand as far away from our patients as possible, do a minimal exam and to walk out. Um, the patients were now a threat to us. That was said to me. Um, given that his respiratory st status was worsening and I was just standing there, I immediately called for respiratory therapy to come. I was worried he might need to get intubated. I still remember the respiratory therapist uh, coming to the door, looking in from the glass part of the door and telling me that she was only coming in if I was sure that he needed to be intubated. She was not going to expose herself otherwise. I was scared of COVID too. This was just the beginning. Juan was my first COVID patient. I didn't know much about it. I had read all I could, but it's not the same as when you're standing in front of someone. Um, one thing I did know though, um, that Juan may have been a threat from an infectious disease standpoint, but Juan was a person. Um, and I remember in that moment, um, and this is where I realized from the beginning that all these years, these 11 conferences that we've had and the friendship that we've shared here aren't just to fill our time because, um, and I don't know how much of this was really clear in my head in the moment, or it's a judgment that I made later, or, but I clearly, um, remember, I don't know if you guys remember Dr. Brescia speaking to us years ago, and he was an older physician who had dealt with the AIDS pandemic back in the day, and he had described to us the way he had cared for um, a homeless woman dying of AIDS, and literally he had described her body as rotting away and something that people just wanted to, to toss, and I remember him saying, in her eyes, he had seen the value of the whole world. And so each patient um, carries that for us. And it was the same thing that had me um, convinced to become a physician when Elvira taught me, you know, back when I was um, a high school student, that a premature baby who weighs 400 pounds also carries the value of the whole world in them. And so in that moment, um, again, it's a, it's a haze. Um, but I do remember walking towards Juan and not being reckless. I mean, I, I didn't want to catch COVID, but I just knew my job right now is to be here with him. And so I finally got close to him and I held his hand and I started, I realized that he needed to be coached through breathing. Um, and this is something else that had struck me at a medical conference. Um, I think the last one we had where Karan, a physical therapist from Canada, had spoken to us about the importance of you know, meeting our patients where they're at. And I have this image in my mind of him describing a difficult patient who wouldn't rehab and him kneeling in front of him at the same height of the patient sitting in the wheelchair and looking at him. And all of a sudden this patient that had been labeled as difficult for not wanting to rehab looked at him back and he said, you know, and convinced the patient uh, to work with him. 
And it was a very simple comment, but he had said, sometimes we just have to help the patients remember that they're also human. And then we discover our humanity in them. And so in that same moment, I held um, Juan's hand and eventually we realized that his COVID was pretty bad, but what was happening was that he was having a panic attack. And so um, in just a few minutes, uh, he was able to remain on nasal cannula and I was able to move on to the next room. That day I saw 12 more Juans. Um, I came out of the unit and I was spent. Um, I remember, you know, in the beginning, we thought COVID could live on surfaces for more than 72 hours. And so I remember um, scrubbing myself in the terrible OR shower for a long time um, and changing and then charting and then coming home. And what we used to do was strip in the garage, run straight in the shower before kissing or touching any of my kids. Um, and that very first night, um, I remember I had decided that I was gonna sleep in the guest room because I didn't wanna put my kids and my husband at risk. And I remember crying myself to sleep um, in the guest room downstairs and um, feeling a sense of doom. Um, this was never gonna end and I was too weak to endure this. My kids and my husband were upstairs and I was living, it felt like I was living a parallel reality. Um, after that first night, um, my husband could tell that I was not doing well. And I remember him telling me, you know, it's true that your vocation is to be a doctor, but our vocation as your husband and, you know, your own children, we have a vocation to your job as well. And so we're going to face this together. You're going to eat meals with us and you're going to sleep upstairs with us. And if we catch it, we catch it, but we're in this together. Um, so I would still come home, strip in the garage, shower for a long time, but I would be with them. And I try to snuggle my kids more than before. COVID was here to stay. And so I realized that part of it had to be uh, to learn to juggle the reality of it while trying to do distance learning with my kids, being a wife and caring for our home. As months passed, um, we started to learn more about the disease and yet it continued to remain a mystery. Um, I remember going home at night thinking you'll come back to those patients and then you come in the next day and even the stable ones and in our office we have a large whiteboard and in the morning you find out if your patients died and I just remember walking in and seeing these names listed on the board and just not I had not you know predicted it and I just felt defeated um, so Sandy was my 74 year old Spitfire independent woman. She was single, but had a niece who had dedicated her entire life to her. And I had gotten Sandy out of the ICU. She had been intubated um, for COVID. And by the time she was transferred to me, um, she was down to two liters of oxygen. And the sign out to me was she's improving. Probably tomorrow she'll get to go home. I remember calling the nieces, the niece and telling her, you know, your aunt is well and she'll come home. She got extubated, she's stable. She's talking, eating, doing all things. Tomorrow, come get her. Um, that next morning, I come in, and the first page of the day is that Sandy's blood pressure is tanking. I assess her at the bedside. She's barely conscious. Her breathing is stable, but her abdomen is distended. Um, she eventually loses a, her pulse, and we start running a code. Um, as part of the workup, Sandy's hemoglobin comes back at five. She was bleeding. We stabilize her, get her to the ICU. And I'm there with my colleague um, who was taking over for ICU care. And we review the entire chart. We go through all of it. Sandy had been on full anticoagulation because uh, of the hypercoagulable state that COVID causes. And that very treatment has now led her to develop a fatal spontaneous retroperitoneal bleed, a bleed that will not be contained, a bleed that will kill her. So I... Um, Sorry, I still get emotional about Sandy. Um, we call Denise and I almost felt like I was crazy because the day before I had told her, come get her to bring her home and now I'm calling her to tell her to, to, that she's dead. Um, so even from that, um, Sandy's case crushes me truly, as you can tell, I haven't recovered. But I also realized COVID is not just, um, a respiratory illness. COVID is complex. It affects different patients differently. Each patient um, 
I don't know, doesn't respond to it the same way. And um, it's a beast. It's a beast that we cannot contain. And it makes me feel powerless. I cry. I cried a lot over Sandy. Um, but I pull myself together. I finish taking care of my other patients. And I drive home. And I remember just stripping in the garage, as always, and just showering and feeling so broken. Um, and then there is reality, right? You come out of the shower and there is my, at the time, preschooler who was bored out of his mind from being home. Um, my seven-year-old who has always had issues with reading and writing, who now does not get the support that she needs from in-person learning. And then there's my nine-year-old who was um, already battling severe anxiety before the pandemic, who is now doing much worse. And then there is my husband who's trying to work from home while being interrupted constantly and therefore losing his temper constantly. And I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like this will never end. Um, but then, you know, there are moments and I hear um, my parents on FaceTime helping my seven-year-old read, uh, friends that come off and come around and drop off food um, or, getting on Zoom every night with um, some of our friends and praying a decade of the rosary every night. And, and I know I'm not alone. And I get up and I do it again all over the next day. So things at work get harder. Um, I've become pretty close to some of my colleagues at work. And we had entered a routine where we always start together and ate lunch together, took a coffee break together. Now we're all quarantining in our cubicles. We eat alone, we pass each other and we want to support each other, but we're all scared. But even that there is a light, you know, we start becoming smart about ways to help each other to still be around each other with our PPE on. We, wait, we find ways to share this difficult time together and we accompany each other in, in, in other ways that are different. And then over the months that followed our hospital, found ways to be more efficient and to manage these patients in a better way. We're learning a lot from a medical standpoint. Um, and then a medical unit becomes a designated COVID unit and the staff on Med One uh, has now been forced to become the COVID staff. So what I had felt that day, uh, walking into the COVID unit for the first time, that feeling of entering a war zone alone and ready to take on the world, and then be crushed by it, has now become its own terrifying but beautiful ward. You will soon hear from, who now I can call my friend Lisa, who was initially just my COVID charge RN, but who quickly became truly a pillar for me in this pandemic. Lisa, with the help of a few nurse friends who truly saw COVID as a calling, have revolutionized that unit and have made it, again, a terrifying, beautiful ward. Trust me, I've gotten myself out of COVID rounding. During dark days, I still get tachycardic when I have to round on 15 COVID patients. So I'm not in denial. I'm not saying that it's become easy. But in the midst of such horror, I think something beautiful is really happening on that fifth floor at our hospital. I can say with certainty that I have um, reaffirmed my love for medicine because of what I have experienced and continue to witness there. It, Honestly, seems crazy sometimes that um, it took a pandemic for me to rediscover the beauty of working as a real team, to rely on my nurses and to truly help each other do what's best for the patient. Um, I am so moved by those COVID nurses. They take full ownership of their patients. They remind me of the NICU nurses. I had never seen nurses love their patients as much as NICU nurses, but now I am witnessing it in the COVID unit. And so we sit outside of the room or we go in the room together we strategize, we come up with a plan of care. Um, but then we also, we've become friends. We ask each other about our kids, our struggles, our spouses, we laugh and oftentimes we cry together. Um, I had recently taken a break from COVID rounding. Um, we can kind of get out of it if you find somebody to work it for you. And I, I could tell that I was getting burnt out. And so I had, um, I had gotten out of it. And then actually this last week, I accidentally ended up on it because I made a trade with a friend and didn't realize that he was assigned COVID. Um, and on my first day back, um, literally this past Tuesday, I was immediately paged in the beginning to assess um, Nick, who was a 36-year-old, decompensating from a respiratory standpoint. He had just recently been diagnosed with COVID. So I rushed there. I walk in. 
And I swear that sound of a man younger than me gas gasping for air pierces my soul once again. I literally had a moment and I was like, this is why I don't do this or try to get myself out of it. And instead, like I pull myself together, work with the nurse, we figure out what he needs. We get orders in to transfer him. We, you know, and I walk out and my heart is racing. We're 18 months into this darn pandemic and people are still dying. Younger people are dying and our ICU is at capacity and we're powerless. So I'm literally standing in the hallway and all of a sudden Lisa comes over, she's COVID charged. She looks at me, she can tell that I'm struggling. She hugs me and she tells me, get it together. Nick is our priority. He needs to listen to what we have to do and we need to get him to the right place. Let's do this. And, and I got going and we got Nick where he needed to go. Um, I am now rounded on Nick every day for the last five days. We've done everything that we can for him and he's not getting better. Nick cries every single time I walk into his room. He has an 11 year old he wants to get home to and I have an 11 year old, so this is really real. Nick has been drinking really heavily since his wife left him five years ago and his alcoholism combined with COVID will most likely kill him sooner than later. On Thursday, um, I'm in my office charting and there is a rapid response called on Nick. And next door to Nick is Dave. Dave is my other COVID patient. He's 50 and healthy, never drank, never smoked. He also has three kids and a wife who loves him a lot. Well, while Nick is getting sicker, so is Dave. I'm standing outside debating which room to go into first. And the nursing supervisor looks at me and says, Dr. Fromm, we have one ICU bed. What do we do? Who gets it? And I just looked at him and said, who gets it? Like, who deserves it more? Are you kidding me? Like, do I need to decide right now whether Nick, who maybe has messed up and has drank too much, but he's 36, or Dave, who's done everything right? Um, ultimately, I reached, you know, I got a hold of administration and said this was not my call to make. And, um, and they took over in making that decision. But you know, the tough part has been, you know, our resources are limited and we have multiple geriatric metastatic cancer patients who have been on the vent for months due to COVID and are using resources, you know, that maybe should be made available to Nick and Dave, but who gets to make the call? Who decides whose life is more worth, more worth living? But the interesting thing that I was told by administration is that in Minnesota, our numbers are not getting better. We are still in the thick of the pandemic. And the governor has declared that COVID is a political disease and therefore he will not claim a state of emergency. Um, and so we just move on with our day as if Dave and Nick were not real. But to me, they're very real. To me and to the RN at the bedside um, and the staff who has to bathe them and watch both Nick and Dave gasp for, for air, this is not political, this is, this is real. Um, I'm almost done, I promise, but I can't end um, a talk on COVID without mentioning the pure hatred that I have developed towards the fact that COVID has become political. If wearing an N95 and watching people die has not exhausted me, I can assure you that the conversations about COVID with non-medical people has scarred my soul. It's been so hard um, to come to work day in and day out, and then having to come home and be around people and having endless conversations about COVID is political and how it's not that much worse than the flu, how the government is all is wrong. And my, fa and my favorite line, if you believe in God, how can you believe in COVID? Um, of course, a dialogue is necessary. I am not saying I am always happy to have the discussion. And of course, we're all learning about COVID as we go, but COVID is real, just like the damage that it has caused, it's real. I remember reading an article in the Atlantic um, in the beginning of the pandemic, talking about healthcare professionals feeling unseen. Um, I don't care if you think that COVID is not that deadly, I, I am watching people die every day. I've seen more people die in these last 18 months than um, in my entire career. And so part of me um, during these discussions just want to be saying, look at me, look at us. I am here, I am witnessing the death. We are breaking, please try to do your part, you know? 
Um, but you learn to try to remain diplomatic. You try not to think of Th Sandy every time or Juan or Nick or Dave. And when they tell you it's not that bad, you just try to swallow it and move on. Um, and I learned to stay quiet most times, um, but I also realized it was slowly crushing me. I remember finding myself watching a stupid show while I was running um, on my, working out on my elliptical and it was just, they decided to portray a COVID unit. And I found myself crying without even realizing it. I was watching them run a code. Um, in a Hollywood type of way. And I was just weeping. The PTSD from this is real. 15 out of my 50, 17 out of my 50 colleagues have decreased their full-time employee this year because of burning out. Many of my favorite RNs have left the inpatient setting. I cried tears of joy the day I got my vaccine. I felt a hint of hope that day. I felt an answer to a year long prayer. I was ridiculed by many friends for getting it and for pushing loved ones to do the same. Are there no risks involved? Of course, I don't know all of it, but what I do know is that I want to be part of the solution. I want to end, um, to be a help in ending this pandemic. Do I think that more research needs to be done? Do I think that you know, studies should be done to try to find medications that treat COVID or diminish the symptoms? Of course, of course I am not denying that any of that should not be done. But in the meantime, in the meantime, this is what's been given to us right now. And I feel like I have to do my part. But right now there's no trust in medicine. There's no trust in doctors. And this has been more painful, I think, than the disease itself. I no longer am a source of knowledge for many of my patients. They know best, Facebook knows yeah. best. And this is hard, this is hard for me to watch. And the very last thing I will say, um, I just want to tell you about Tim. Tim is 70. He's healthy, active. He's not vaccinated. And now this is what we're seeing. 95% um, of our patients are unvaccinated. Um, no one in his family is vaccinated either. And he was admitted to the COVID unit because he couldn't breathe. He ultimately was intubated, was on a ventilator for 10 days. He was one of the lucky ones to get extubated and come back to me on the regular medical COVID unit. I met Tim the day he left the ICU. His wife is there, he's feeling better, he's on two liters of oxygen and hopeful to go home the next day. 24 hours later, I come back to find Tim on 15 liters of oxygen. Nurse warns me right away that Tim is not looking good. We scan him emergently and I review the images with the pulmonologist and the radiologist and there, Tim has almost no viable lung tissue left. Tim will die. I stand in the room and I share this with Tim um, and he's gasping for air. The wife is wailing, that crying pitch that also pierces your soul. And the daughter on the phone is accusing me of being her father's murderer. Give him vitamin D for God's sakes. I have told you so many times and IV zinc. I demand a new doctor who knows what they're doing. In the midst of having to tell a man that he's going to die, in the midst of being terrified about COVID because you can't, you seem like you're improving and then it turns around and kills you, I have to stand there and take it. I have to be sympathetic and try to be respectful to someone who does not know what they're talking about and is trying to force me to do something I know is medically futile. But you stand there, you take it, then you defend yourself as politely as you can. You encourage them to get vaccinated. They yell at you some more. And then you proceed to make Tim comfortable and he dies that works later. I just vaccinated my three children on Monday. Another super hot topic that I love to talk about. My husband and I talked about it. Are we being reckless? Are we being stupid? Or are we entrusting that we're called to a greater good by slowing down the spread of COVID so that maybe Nick or Dave or Tim might have lived? My um, difficult 11 year old questioned us on the vaccine. Um, my nine year old was told by her schoolmate, I hope I see you tomorrow that you don't die from it. And at the same time, I drive them there and I give them the same answer um, that um, recently we were at church and my 11 year old who's again, very stubborn. Um, they had just started giving out wine again at mass. And I had asked her to please not take it. And she was really mad at me and told me, I'm gonna go up there and do it and you're not gonna stop me. 
But I remember holding her hand and looking her in the eye and saying, Emma, look at this old lady in front of us. She immediately says, I don't even know her mom. And I replied, that's correct. But if you drink the wine and there is a small chance that maybe you have COVID and you don't know it, and she drinks it after you, it might be a very, very small chance, but maybe she would get it and maybe she would die. She turns around and without even batting an eyelash, she says, oh my gosh, of course then I won't. And she hasn't questioned us on it since. The same with the vaccine. We asked them to take a risk for the good of the people around us. So if even an 11 year old can understand the concept that it's worth making a sacrifice for the good of the world, why can't we? Our world, because of all these difficulties, I think has become really selfish. Um, and we decide things based on what my needs are and what my family needs. But isn't it so much better to follow our pride, take a risk, look up and say, my life has been given to me as a gift. And am I not here to serve? So even though it's very tough to walk into the rooms of all these unvaccinated patients these days and not be bitter, trust me, compassion fatigue is a real thing. I have noticed that anger quickly fades as I look them in the eye and watch them gasping for air. And in that moment, there's no resentment, just a prayer and the best of my medical expertise that their lives might be spared. But after that, we can do better. We need to do better. But you can't convince anyone with an argument. You simply accompany them. You try to enter into a relationship and hope that they can see maybe a tiny bit that you don't have a political agenda. You just want Sandy, Nick, Tim to live. I love my job. I love my colleagues. And I pray daily that this pandemic will end. But I am more certain today than ever before. This terrible virus has been a gift to reinforce our love for medicine, for humanity, and for the world. My friends, my colleagues, this place, like the Med Conference, has been what sustains me. We're not enemies. We're all finite human beings trying to navigate this terrible storm together. The road is beautiful if we walk it together. So I can just ask to keep walking forward, having mercy and compassion towards each other, and um, remembering that we're all longing for truth, for justice, for love. We all want the same. We just need to remind each other, forgive each other, and accompany each other like we're doing today. And now I'd like for you guys to meet Lisa, who will talk after me. And like I said, she's been my charge nurse and a great friend. So good morning. Um, I wanna thank you all for having me. Um, Dr. Fromm, thank you for inviting me and I'm glad we could make it work out with the things that I have going on also. So a bachelor's prepared registered nurse at the St. Cloud Hospital. I work as a staff nurse as well as a charge nurse on medical unit one, otherwise at this time, the COVID unit. I've worked on that unit for 19 and a half years. Prior to that, um, I grew up in the nursing home setting, starting in laundry and discovering that I couldn't get up at 3 a.m. for a 4 a.m. start shift, so I had to go to housekeeping. And then I worked my way as a nursing assistant through nursing school. Um, I wanted to become an LPN, um, but I was taking courses for my RN just in case I ever wanted to be an RN. So I lived with my husband of almost 20 years and our three girls on a 20 acre farm. We have a few animals, but mostly we like to just go to the creek fishing, go four wheeler riding um, and go for walks in the woods. My in-laws live right next door to us um, and they own about 200 acres. So we have a ton of room to roam and um, things to do. Um, it's kind of like that show everyone loves Raymond. They're always coming over here. And at first I really didn't like it, but I really wouldn't have it any other way now. My husband's diabetic. Um, he has high blood pressure. Um, he has shingles on his optic nerve. So he's on a few medications. My daughter was born with craniosynostosis. Um, so we've been in hospitals plenty. Um, and my in-laws are diabetic and they have a number of medical concerns too. So a little bit about why I became a nurse to start with. Um, when I was nine years old, I was in an accident and I fell off the top of a backhoe about 20 feet up. I really remember it like it was yesterday. I was playing kick the can and I was trying to get away. So I was climbing higher and higher and eventually I was at the top of the cab. My foot slipped and I fell. I was falling head first and I remember seeing the ground but there was another kid climbing on the tracks um, and he stuck his arms out, he said, to catch me. 
And of course, instead of catching me, he hit me. And so I fell on my legs instead of breaking my neck. So I thank him for that. But I broke one of my legs. Um, and so the adults that were there threw me on a piece of plyboard and put me in the back of a station wagon and drove me to the St. Cloud Hospital. They told my mom later they shouldn't have done that and that I could have died because the leg was not stabilized in any way. And all I remember is the leg rolling side to side and it seemed to me like it was rolling almost all the way around, but all I remember was the pain and it being so incredible. They fixed me up there. I spent two and a half weeks in traction at the hospital and another six weeks in a body cast at home. While I was hospitalized, um, there were several really nice nurses, but there was one who I would look forward to her coming in. My family couldn't be with me due to my dad didn't work in the state and my mom had to take care of my other siblings, but my grandma would stay with me sometimes. But otherwise it was just me, my Barbie hanging from the trapeze and the nurses. I don't remember that nurse's name, but all I remember is the way she made me feel every time she came in the room. When my Barbie would fly off the trapeze and onto the floor, she never complained about the number of times she had to pick it up. And anyone who knows me knows that I probably made that Barbie fly off that trapeze hundreds of times. She would read me stories at night and she would braid my hair each day she was there. She would sit and visit with me about anything. I love the way she made me feel when I was sick and that's how I wanted to make others feel when they were not well. There were a number of nurses who left my Barbie lay on the floor and my long hair unwashed. I remember how that made me feel too. It was from the hospital stay that I knew I wanted to be a nurse a nurse just like her and never strayed from that desire. So I wanted to become an LPN so I would have more time with the patients and not get wrapped up with the paperwork, insurance, families. I could just take care of the patients. But then I discovered that I really liked college and while completing my RN degree, I worked as an LPN. Um, so after a number of different jobs, I was hired as a new grad on medical unit one. I really didn't wanna be on that unit but it was where the greatest need was so I agreed to it. I've always worked 12 hour shifts, day night rotation, 10 year nights. Um, now I'm straight days, um, but I pick up a fair number of overnights and off shifts. I've always enjoyed my work. I've never considered it a job. It has always just been something I have enjoyed doing, um, caring for people. But as I thought it would be, a lot of my time was spent in documentation and talking with families and other things besides caring for the patients. When H1N1 hit, our unit was chosen as the unit where these patients would be admitted and it felt to me like we were doing something no one else wanted to. The doors on the unit were closed and we were brought food so we wouldn't infect anyone else if we went to the cafeteria. And as weird as it may sound, I didn't mind it. I really felt like I was making a difference. Physicians would come in and spend five minutes in the room, never really offer to help with the turn of a patient or feed them or really even acknowledge nursing staff unless it was to tell us to do something. And that's okay, that's what we really were there for. Um, you know, I've cared for my fair share of GI bleeds, ETOHers, end of life, dialysis patients, and really everything in between. And take pride in my work. I work with amazing coworkers who all I did, so I did for them, but they also have helped me through my family's numerous diagnosis, the birth of my kids, and really just general nursing support. You know, sometimes you get nurses started and you come in with a hangnail and all of a sudden your arm is amputated because you've got gangrene in it or something. But you just let the nurses talk and it usually goes good. But I also learned that if you wanted something done, you really just had to ask one of those nurses and it was done with prestige and pride. Every new thing to me is a new opportunity for learning. And um, quickly you also learn that there is no humor like nurse humor. So then there was this new thing we heard about COVID-19. It sounded pretty sketchy, but scary for my family with all the health problems we deal with daily. I didn't want it and I didn't want my family to get it. So when I saw on TV, they were asking for volunteer nurses to go to New York to help out. I thought, yes, I'm going to do that so I can learn about it and how to protect my family when it comes here. And I can do it without putting any of them in danger because I wouldn't be around them. So I told my husband this, and of course he didn't want me to go. So I was, I was patient and basically just tried to learn everything that I could, could hear. So when it came here, I would know. When Centric Care asked for volunteers, I raised my hand. I felt like this is what I was called to do. I felt I could really make a difference and this was going to be my way. I told my husband I would live in the garage and I would stay away from him and the kids as much as I could. He very clearly, clearly told me I would not be living in the garage and if I got sick, we were all gonna get sick. I remember thinking I was gonna feel really bad if any of my family members would get this from me, but I knew he was just as concerned as I was and that was his way of showing me that he supported me. So the COVID unit was first put on our neural floor because of the airflow that was needed. And from the first day we took patients, I went there. I worked as the charge nurse and as a staff nurse. 
I was scared that first patient assignment. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. We didn't know what to expect, what was gonna happen. But from the first step I took in that unit, I knew I was needed. The patients just looked at you, unable to breathe, unable to be with their families, scared, and watching one of the political channels talk about their diagnosis and reporting most will die from it. They would then ask us, am I really gonna die? As they were short of breath, it was hard to answer because at that point we didn't know anything more than they did really. They didn't know either what was gonna go on. And so we couldn't really be honest with them because we didn't know. The nurses were the only ones really going in the rooms and some of the providers. Um, the nurses were asked to do most everything, housekeeping, diabetic education, case management, social worker, respiratory therapy, and we did. We did everything while others stood at the doors and watched. It was scary. After the first few weeks, it was really kind of old hat to the few of us who chose to enter through the doors. We were still scared, but we knew it was gonna be okay. New staff would come and go. Um, many would cry because they didn't wanna go in, but someone would always comfort them and support them and say, I'm with you, let's do it together. And usually by lunchtime, they were caring for their patients like they had done it for years. They were never alone. Our staff always supported them. Other staff would say, well, I have an at-risk family at home. And I would really just smile because we were all at risk, as was my family. But I thought, your family is no more important than mine. But if you aren't able to do it, I will do it for you. So I and a number of other staff bared the load of the COVID patients for quite a while. But after about a month and a half on the neural floor, it was decided to move the COVID patients to medical unit one. This was a little bit of a relief because I was going to get to go back to my home unit, but a curse because I knew we would never get out of having them, at least for not for a long time, because I knew once the med one staff commit to something, we do it and we do it well. Some of the staff we were working with on the neuro unit was no longer volunteering to come to the unit, and we basically used our med one staff primarily for COVID patients. We did have several staff members that chose not to work with the COVID patients and with the doctor note was, were exempt from being on our unit. So for the last 20 months or so, I have only cared for COVID patients. I haven't had a general medical patient, um, just COVIDs. The staff really took the challenge of caring for these patients and embraced it. We have always had good teamwork on Med One, but it pushed it to a new level. When someone was having a bad day, the team will do their work for them and support them. When someone loses a patient three shifts in a row, the team is there to support them. When someone just needs an extra break from the mask, someone else will put their mask on and go in the room. When the staff who wear the pappers, which are so loud in their ears and I, I know they can't hear anything and we tell inappropriate jokes, we'll even repeat the jokes so that they can hear it. The staff have pulled together so much, um, in my opinion, I don't think any, any other unit would have or could have. The staff on this medical unit are the most patient, forgiving, understandable, compassionate people I've ever known. We pick up numerous shifts, most of us working 16, 17 hours, numerous shifts in a row, just so our coworkers are not left without help. We give up our family time so we can care for others. This dedication and care did not go unnoticed. And once the physicians had done a couple rounds on the COVID unit and were a little more comfortable, I think they started to understand that there was a break for them, but the Med One staff never got to leave COVID. And they really started to embrace helping us. So really under the watchful eye of the nurses, um, we would let them touch the patients, but just a little at first, and then they started to help the patients get into bed if they were going in the room to do an assessment on them. They would bring in water for us. They would bring in their meal trays. Um, I saw a couple of them even touch an IV when we asked them to and even walked a patient to the bathroom. They would say, I'm going in anyways, you know, and offer their help. Um, and like I said, I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty funny at first because um, they were pretty nervous about the actual little things that they were doing when we were watched them so many times run, run code so proficiently. Um, to us, bringing a patient to the bathroom was basic, but to them, the gate belt, a walker, eight lines, um, it was really stressful. But we really did try to help and most of the time they got a laugh out of it too. A lot of times the patients would ask if they were gonna be charged more now that the doctor had helped them. So the patients kinda, kinda got into it too. It was a fantastic relationship that were built with these providers. They trusted us to help them with orders when they were not sure what had changed since they had been there last and when it was time to transfer. Um, we do have a lot of patients that we have on the general medical floor that are on 15 liters, non-rebreather and oxygen saturations right at that 88 to 90%. Um, but a lot of times the nurses that we have are pretty confident in 
the way that the patient's going and the doctors listen. And if we say, the, we think the patient's okay to stay for a little longer, the doctors will leave them and say, thank you, let us know when you need something. So although thank you was used a lot before, the new thank you seemed different. It's, it was, it's now said with meaning and caring. It's kind of a new line on the unit along with other nursing jokes, but the jokes also mean thank you. As time goes on, COVID is a word that we still really don't like to use. So a lot of our nurses will refer to it as the vid or Rona, the one niner. To us, it's still, it's still a scary diagnosis, but we go in, we get gowned up. Um, we don't have to comb our hair. We don't have to wash our clothes. And we have really learned a lot. We've learned how to care for these patients. And that's just that. Caring for these patients has allowed me to do that. I bathe them, I turn them, I braid their hair, and I spend time in their rooms talking with them. I'm able to get right back to the basic roots of nursing, and I know that the patients are thankful. Some of them don't believe in COVID, some of them straight up tell us it's not real and this is something else. Um, some of us will say it's not that bad um, and they're still not getting vaccinated. Some of them don't understand the nursing instructions of prone until they really can't breathe. And then on their stomach they go on their way to be ventilated or intubated. And as they try to tell us they're sorry for not following directions, we continue to comfort them and tell them it's okay. And when they're feeling better or get off the vent, if that's possible, they come back and we take care of them with just as much honor. I will say some of them listen a little bit better though when they get back to us. Uh, we do our best to support each patient. We wanna believe each patient is gonna get better, but we know that it's not the truth, but we don't give up on any of them. We have seen the success and we have seen when they fall, but each one is treated the same. The staff find strength in each other. As long as we all don't have a bad day on the same day, I tell the staff, we're gonna get through the day. We try really hard to make sure each patient is able to participate in home events, even if they're not able to attend. We have had many patients who miss the weddings, birthday parties, birth of their own children and grandchildren, and deaths of loved ones due to the hospitalization or quarantine. We know how important these are to them and we will do whatever to help them. Um, we did have a wedding up on our unit. We had a patient who was so mad at everybody. So they sent me in because they thought I could get out of him what his, what his deal kind of was because he wasn't in that much respiratory distress. He ended up telling me that he, um, his son was getting married that day and he had been waiting for this for years. It was his youngest son, his only son. And um, he was just really sad. And so I told him he wasn't missing the wedding and um, we didn't have Skype or Zoom or anything set up yet. So we did use our personal phones and we FaceTimed with his family. Um, we were able to find him a donated shirt. Um, we made him a corsage out of some of our PPE. We took a flower out of a different patient's vase with their permission. And we put some sheets up in the back to cover all the monitors. And he said, finally, we can't go to a wedding smelling like this. And I said, I just gave you a shower. He said, I got some cologne, we're spraying it on. So he put some cologne on and we all sat and we went to that wedding together. Um, we muted it after, he muted it after a little while and he told us every single grandchild because they were passing the phone around and he told us what he loved about them and what was special about every single one of them. His son and his wife, the new wife, stopped on their way back down the aisle to tell him how much they loved him and how they wished he was there, but how they were so excited that he could watch um, through the phone. We saw his obituary later um, and it thanked the nursing staff for helping him and just mentioned how much they appreciated um, us being able to do that for him. We make experiences like this happen a lot for our patients because we know it's, it's hard on everybody um, and we want them to get better. And we know that it might be the last time because like Dr. Fromm was saying, they just change so quickly with their respiratories. These days really remind me of my time when I worked in the nursing home and they seemed like the same nurse and they just become really attached to us, a familiar face, a caring voice and a friend. The physician nurse relationships have flourished beyond what I could ever imagine from when we cared for the H1N1 patients. They now joke about the first time they tried help turning a patient or brought a tray in the room um, or when we ask them to put on a different oxygen device and they look extremely confused, um, but they do it as we walk them through. Um, we had one of the doctors who really isn't the most joking around type of doctor, but he said, if you girls get a team together, I'll get a team together and we can have wheelchair races down the hallway just to lighten the mood up here. 
Um, so we didn't do it, but I can only imagine about how competitive that would have been. The struggles on the unit are real. I've seen more in the last 20 months of, than nursing school or 18 years of experience could have ever prepared me for. Watching a pregnant mom try to breathe while in the last trimester when we have her prone, then just having to send her to the ICU to be intubated. The husband wife pairs who come in and we have to tell them the one in the middle, we have to tell one of them in the middle of the night that the other one's being intubated just to know that they're gonna be following shortly behind if there's an ICU bed available. The father mother trio who are all admitted in a row of rooms and can hear each other coughing and suffering and one passing away. Taking family members to the ICU to say goodbye to their family members through a window when they know that they're gonna to have to come back up to the unit to fight exactly what their loved one just died from. We had a patient who had passed away and spiritual care was not going into the room. And it was just the patient and the, um, the family member in there and she was struggling and struggling. So I went into the room. I know they tell us to limit contact, but it's hard for a nurse to limit contact when we're trying to care for a patient. And perhaps she didn't need a hug, although she looked like she did. But I, I hugged her because I needed the hug more. Um, these are weekly, if not daily occurrences, sometimes on the unit. And although the nurses struggle, we always try to find a way to get through it. No one really understands what us nurses are going through except the other nurses who are there every single day. Our families don't see what we're seeing. All they felt was that when we got home, we didn't wanna give them a kiss and hug. We told them they couldn't go anywhere outside the house. And what they didn't understand was it was out of love and not wanting to get them sick. But that's not really how it felt to them. Many nurses would come to work exhausted and sad, not only because of what we were dealing with at home, but what we were facing each night when we go home and understand to a point what I was telling them was going on, gave love and kindness to me, but also became withdrawn and sad, which was happening to so many other health care. Loved it. They got extra time with their kids and families and loved being at home and enjoying the small things. While I loved it for them, I was dying inside because they had no idea what the healthcare professionals were going through. We had less time with our families. And it seemed if there was no appreciation for those of us who had to be there to take care of these patients because of the symptoms that directly affect them and their family. But we all knew one day it will affect all families. Everybody was going to be affected and was real and affecting the community and world. My parents would not wear a mask. They said it was silly. It didn't work and whatever kids had the same feelings. My brother and his wife, although didn't wear a mask, kept their thoughts to themselves. My parents would get mad because I wouldn't come over and when I did, I wore a mask and so did my kids. I was criticized as many of my coworkers were for not wanting to gather for the holidays. And when I gave it, and when I gave in and went, I wore a mask to the gathering. I was looked at kind of like pull it together, Lisa. This is fun because we are family and I love you. This past Wednesday, I was talking to one of the providers and I jokingly said, I just wish my family would understand. None of them have had it. And I wish my family would just understand a little bit where I'm coming from. So maybe they would get vaccinated or at least stop giving me and my family a hard time for my attention to the illness. Perhaps I should be more careful as to what I wish for. We got a call two days ago that six of them tested positive. So that's that, I guess. Um, during this whole time for many of us, work was a place where we felt safe in our thoughts. And when we cry, no one asked a single question. You just got a hug. No one judged you when you said you got angry at your kids. They said you're doing your best, keep it up. We offer to bring items to the houses of the nurses who are COVID positive with a smile and what else can we do for you? The providers ask, they wait until you tell them the real answer and the physician who will give me a hug each time I see her because I think she knows I need it. There are so many providers who have pulled out their credit cards and have said, here, just order something for you all to eat and then we'll come up and eat with us. They understand better now, I think, that than when it first came, although we know that they were very scared too and they just weren't around it every single day most of the time. They understand that 
although food doesn't take care of what's going on. It makes us happy if only for a short period of time. And we know that at any point we can ask any of those physicians for help and they will put their mask on and go in. The providers have been such a huge part of why the nurses continue and we recognize they need us just as much as the patients do. And together we know we can get through this. We just need to be kind to one another and understand. It for sure has taken a toll and we were all feeling really alone, like I said. So I thought, what can I do to help me and what can I do to help the other nurses? So I thought a book of all of this would be fantastic. So with the help of two of my other colleagues, um, we collected stories. We asked for staff, specifically the nurses and providers to write a story. It was basically a thank you, a story about a specific patient, a happy story, sad story, just something that will help us feel that tight connection that after all the tragedy we've been facing may help us start to heal. And after reading only three of them, I started to feel like a part of me was coming back to life. Although I knew it, I could see I wasn't the only one who was feeling the emotions I was having and the struggles with what was going on. So we got about 100 stories from nurses, physicians, housekeepers, palliative care, even administration. And as I spoke with my family about this, my oldest daughter asked if she could write a story. I agreed and then I read her perspective of a 15 year old of what was going on. She was just the type of daughter that I knew I had in what she wrote in her story. Part of it said, I wanted my mom home so bad, but I knew others needed her more. Right now, the stories are in the process of being put into a book and we're gonna give it to the nurses in an effort to help all of them heal. Many of the Med One nurses have already read some of the stories and found comfort and peace in them. So we're hoping this book will help other nurses, physicians and families understand what it is like to work on the COVID unit and what these nurses have been going through and really what the patients have been going through. So we've had a lot of number of staff leaving for many different reasons, um, but none that I know of have left because we are caring for strictly COVID patients. Before they leave, they say they're sorry, they don't wanna leave while staffing is short. Um, we sometimes sit on really critically ill patients for a long time because there are no critical beds available. They feel bad about leaving their Med One family. But as the Med One staff, we continue to be happy for them in their journey after giving them a lot of grief. But we welcome the new staff with honor and pride and make sure they understand how much dedication we have to our COVID patients and welcome them to the best COVID unit ever. We don't have a high turnover rate, and I believe that's because we treat each other with dignity and respect, no matter what choices they have made in life that they have with that brought them with us today for the patients. Vaccinated or not, drug use, inmate, sweet as grandma ever, young or old, I will care for you. We will care for you. We do have a few things going on the unit. We give little, because we are mandated to stay quite a bit, we just have little treat the monthly drawing that we do for the gift cards. Um, this was all staff initiated. Um, no one from administration had um, helped us with any of this. This is just Med One staff taking care of Med One staff. Um, we love getting the thank you cards and we post them up everywhere um, when we get them from patients and families. I feel as much as it's taken out of the staff, we have all continued to find ways to support each other and encourage each person to keep going. The staff continue to be the most generous, caring, compassionate, understanding and caring nurses, nursing assistants, and our one constant, Mike, our beloved housekeeper, who wears a papper for eight hours a day. We are all are picking up extra shifts, staying late, working whatever hours we can to help out, but we basically just have to keep moving forward and we keep helping and we do it with prestige pride and a little bit of entertainment some of the time. So I just wanna thank everybody for listening and um, thank you Dr. Fromm for inviting me. Um, it's very therapeutic for me to write this stuff. And um, as you could tell, I was reading, but many of the nurses I had look over this at the hospital before I brought it. And it brought many of them to tears because they know the pride that we take in caring for these COVID patients. We've been offered a couple times for the COVID unit to be moved to a different unit. And everybody says, no, we don't want it moved. We will continue to take care of these patients. And we can basically, we a lot of the times can tell, you know, from the patients, their thoughts, their feelings, and that one nurse there, we just go along with whatever they say, kind of agreeing with Dr. Fromm there. It's so much energy to argue. You give them your advice, you give them what they can do, but you can only meet them where they are. Thank you. 
Thank you very much to both of you. I think uh, we are a bit over time and there is no time for questions, but what I think about this session is that your experience is really unique, but at the same time, you touched upon so many aspects that each one of us can be like, um, can share in his own experience. And I think this was a great start for this uh, conference in terms of uh, making the big um, horizon of what we have been going through all this year in its different aspects. So uh, I really thank you very much uh, for like having the courage to share what you shared. And um, uh, the next